Corumbin Wildlife Sanctuary. So we've done our park map using the code here. Alrighty. It's $39.95 per person for today, so it's a discounted. Woohoo! Very good, honey. <laughs> Feeding koalas. <laughs> so why do you have to do that? Uh, so all we're doing is sifting out all the deco. So uh -huh. we keep all the leaves, all the poo, separate all the deco, and then we put it in the bin easier. Ah, I see. <laughs> He's alive, look, what's his eyes? He's alive. Hey, fella. Oi. <laughs> Oi, he's alive. Oh. Oh, yeah, he's alive. He's oh. real. I had the better one there over there. Was yeah, the he's alive, alive too. He's alive too. But this, they're both alive. This one's alive too. He's, he's having a snooze. It's like you're going to flinch. He's too used to these people coming around. There he goes. He's oh yeah, he's you. moving. <laughs> we are waiting for the train. This is the main station. We're going to the other side for the train. <laughs> We've only been to one. To one. Okay, then you want to do it? I'll do a
first animals started to explore the Earth's surface. 210 million years ago, the first sign of a bird-like footprint suggests that some dinosaurs are already evolving into birds. 150 million years ago, the first bird took flight and made our once empty skies wild. A mere six million years ago, the first human created the first footprints on Earth. And now, for over 60,000 years, the oldest continuous living culture on Earth, my culture, the indigenous people of Australia, have a connection to the land, the skies, and the wildlife that coexist in. This connection, these stories, the knowledge, they belong to the land, they belong to the wild skies. The power of flight. It has given birds an edge over most other creatures, allowing them to travel further and wider in search of food, and of course live where no other creature could go. So millions, millions of years of evolution has adapted each of our bird species to define in its own individual niche, and has pre-programmed them to nest, to breed and to migrate in their own unique habitat and manner. And the indigenous people of Australia have formed connections with all creatures that have roamed these lands. Where did the animals walk this earth that had once come from the sea and now today fly in our skies? And it is these relationships that have given us stories that hold the history between the indigenous people and these beautiful sky spirits like the ones you are witnessing fly here this afternoon. So great start here to this today. Now it's been for a very long time that humans and primates were the only ones capable of using tools in their environment when it came to hunting. But the black printed buzzards, like nature here, have proved this very far. You see, they discovered that the content of an emu egg is incredibly protein packed. But at the same time as discovering this, they also saw that there was no bird or um, animal really with a beak or talon strong enough to crack through their hard exterior. So they learned, hey, you do, <laughs> oh, I just broke it for it. <laughs> they learned that if they pick up rocks like a hammer, they can actually crack it on down onto that emu egg and I get inside. But I did help her cheat a little bit here today, but hopefully she's going to be used those rocks. She's very protective over her food source because what is inside is very desirable for me. So they're also referred to as the bulldozers of the bush because what they'll do when you approach is they'll drop those wings, they'll cover that food and they'll charge at your food. All right, Major, can you please come back up here for me? Come on. There we go. Now use those rocks like you're supposed to. Major loves to cheat. She loves to get the easy way in. This is a emu egg that we have created for today's show. So there we go. <laughs> Bless the glasses at home. It is made out of plaster, and it does usually have a little bit of tape on it from where we put the hole to put the food inside. So she has actually found that little loophole, and she'd rather just kick and pick and pick until she gets inside. But you see, this behaviour was first told to the early European settlers by the indigenous Australians many, many moons ago. But it's only the last 50 or so years that we've actually been able to authenticate this behaviour because the black breasted buzzards don't really like the company of us humans. So the more we encroach on their territory, the further on further on inland they go. So they're actually very hard to see out in the wild in this day and age. We'll see if she wants to uh, keep going with those rocks here. So there she goes. Oh, not quite in just yet. Because this is the payoff because when it comes to being a wild, uh, wild black breasted buzzard, if you get a whole emu egg, it's a jackpot. You don't have to find food for another couple of days. Which is very important when you do live in the very harsh conditions of Central Australia. It's very dry, very arid, very hard to find food out there. So whatever you can get to, you're going to have to be Alright. <laughs> She's given up here today, but I think she did an okay job. Pretty average, pretty light life. So yeah, you can give her a round of applause. She's a bit of a diva, so I'm sure she'll appreciate it. Unfortunately, like I said, we don't get to see black breasted buzzards that much out in the wild anymore. So you're still very fortunate to see our sunny little bird here on stage today. Thank you, Major. <laughs> but you know, Australia has so many different ecosystems, so many different environments, and a lot of different animals are adore them. And so this guy here likes them as well. This is Marlon. Full speed ahead for him today. Now, Marlon is 
is of course our Australian pelican. Now these guys can reach weight from seven and a half kilos and have a wingspan they can stretch over two and a half meters in length. And here in Australia, that makes them Australia's heaviest flying bird. Now they are commonly seen roosting on those sandbanks, rock platforms, and reefs, but you'll quite frequently see them swimming in our bays, lagoons, and estuarine waters. Now, of course, the most prominent feature on a pelican is that beak. That elongated beak with that hook on the end and that massive throat arch plays a very important role when it comes to feeding for our pelicans. You see, what they'll do is they'll plunge that beak down into the water, and the lining of their pouch is incredibly sensitive. So they can essentially fish with their eyes closed because they can feel the movement of the animals underneath the water. They'll plunge that beak down, they'll take in that big gulp of food, disperse that water through the sides of the beak, and then swallow their prey out and it's completely cold. Now when it's fully extended, it can hold up to 14 litres of water. But unfortunately for the pelican, this way of hunting does leave them quite susceptible to being hooked and entangled in both active and discarded fishing lines. So it's very important to remember guys that one careless action can cause a great deal of harm, but one positive action can prevent it. This next guest gets about 70% of his diet from commercial fishing collars. The extremely adaptable and very cute little crested turn. Now our crested turn today is this monster and watch your head because he does love to give a bit of a haircut. Now these birds have the ability of being able to plunge from high to 10 metres, getting down to depths of around a metre in order to capture their fruit items. They love to feed on fatty things like anchovies and sardines, and you often see them around 10 kilometres from land. Now they're generally out there trying to bulk up and bring lots of food back to their young back on the coastline here. There are very few stretches along the Australian coastline where you will not see a crested turf. Now because they are such small birds and such avid flyers, there has actually been reports of the crested turf being found in most arid parts of Australia, which is a little bit bizarre for a water bird species, but it's believed that sometimes they get blown inland by passing tropical cyclones. Now Monster, you've done an excellent job showcasing that fly here today, please don't need the plaster. I'll grab that for you, I think you and I should head out of here. Come on buddy, let's go. I'll protect you from the, the sun and the thunder. Let's go, come on buddy. You can't eat nature's food, I've got some food for you. Let's go. This way. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> now it is believed that an increase in the number of black pikachus found in an area is a sign of rain to come. And indigenous people of Australia believe that for every bird heard in the clock, it would equal one day's worth of rain. Now due to their large size, walkers, calls and flocking behaviour, black pikachus are easy to spot as they wing gracefully across the sky. Identifying our different species, however, does require a little more attention to detail. Now joining me here on stage today, we have two of our black pikachu species. Phoenix here, showing off that beautiful red tail as you flew over your head, is a female red-tailed black pikachu. And then we have Licorice up here as well. Now she is a female yellow-tailed black pikachu. She's a little bit bigger than the uh, than the red tail. And of course they have that distinguishing yellow cheek patches and that bright yellow tail. Now the yellow tails are a species that you'll quite commonly see here around the Gold Coast area. Red tails however are usually found a little further inland. Now what we'd like to do today is actually offer one of you an opportunity to get a little bit closer to these beautiful girls, certainly a lot closer than you would in the wild. So I was wondering, perhaps a gentleman in the grey shirt here, you could just get, yeah, did you, yeah, you, yeah, you're wearing kind of grey. No? Yeah, you. Do you want to stand up and eat licorice? <laughs> yeah, stand up, arm out to the side, you stay right where you are. There we go, we're going to send her out to say hello. <laughs> Absolutely stunning, isn't she? Now, having this experience like many of you will have here at the same tree today can certainly touch your heart. And it is hoped that the experiences that you have here at Crumpton Wildlife Sanctuary will last with you a lifetime and universally symbolise the powers of night, mystery, and wisdom. Now, looking off at Gorilla here on the hollow, I'm sure we can all agree there's something wonderful, mysterious, and of course alluring about our owl spirit species. But Gorilla here is a lot of called Tycho owl. And she's, a, well, so she's part of the Taito family and she's called a mask owl. That beautiful love heart shaped face you just there acts much like a satellite dish to help funnel sound in towards their ears. So good is that hearing? They can hear the squeaking of a mouse from 800 metres away. 
But a friend like Rio here, they're out the door and stuff. Now listen, that's very nice and as well. Because you might actually hear that two-note call that you make. Now look, this call can be held by their mate, heard by their mates from up to six kilometers away. If their companions can't hear their